Hello and welcome to the 52nd lecture on the history of modern India. The failed peace attempt by India in Sri Lanka. Even as the Indian government was trying to contain secession at home, it had embarked on an ambitious attempt to end ethnic strife in neighboring Sri Lanka. It was for the first time India was meddling in the internal affairs of the neighboring country. Little island, as beautiful in its own way as mountainous Kashmir, was caught in a bloody civil war between the Sinhala majority and the Tamil minority. The causes of the conflict were varyingly familiar to Indians at any rate, as they involved rival claims of language ethnicity, religion, and territory. It is sufficient to say that it really began when Sihala was imposed as the sole official language of the island. The Tamils asked for parity for their own tongue and when this was denied, took to the streets in protest. Over the years, non-violent methods were thrown over in favor of armed struggle. Of the several Tamil resistance organizations, the most influential and powerful were the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Ilam or LTTE, led by a brutal fighter named Villu Pillai Prabhakaran. The LTTE had as its aim a separate nation to be constituted from the north and east of the island, where the Tamils were in majority. Throughout the early 1980s, they mounted raids on Sri Lankan army camps and committed atrocities on civilians. The Sinhala response was even more fierce. In other words, this was a conflict of an almost unspeakable brutality and savagery. LTT fighters had long used the Indian state of Tamil Nadu as a safe haven. Their activities were actively helped by the state government, with New Delhi turning an indulgent blind eye. However, in the summer of 1987, Rajiv Gandhi was asked by the Sri Lankan president J. R. Jayavardhane to help mediate in the conflict. Under an agreement, signed between Colombo and New Delhi, an Indian Peacekeeping Force or IPKF would be flown into the island. The Sri Lankan army would retreat to the barracks and LTT militants persuaded or forced to disarm. In late July 1987, Indian troops began going to Sri Lanka in batches of a few thousand. Eventually, as many as 48,000 soldiers of the Indian Army would be stationed there. Their presence was unpopular among Sihala nationalists, who saw it as an infringement of sovereignty, and among the Tamils, who had always thought that India was on their side. When asked to surrender, the LTT insisted on a series of preconditions including the release of all Tamil prisoners in government custody and a halt to Sihala colonization in the east of the island. Until October, an uneasy peace held, which was broken when the IPKF moved against the militants. The LTT headquarters in Jaffna was stormed and captured, but at an enormous cost. Popular opinion turned decisively against the Indians, who were now seen as an occupying force. The LTT took to the jungles, from where they would snipe and harry the Indians. They made particularly effective use of landmines, blowing up convoys of soldiers as they travelled on the roads. By the end of 1987, the press was writing of Sri Lanka 
as India's Vietnam. For the Indian army had never seen a war like this in an alien land against a foreign enemy that wore no uniforms, knew no Geneva Convention on Ethics of War, yet carried deadly modern weapons and fought routinely from behind the cover of women and children. An Indian commander was slightly more generous. While deploring the LTT's senseless, mulish, destructive insistence on armed struggle, he nonetheless saluted their discipline, dedication, determination, motivation and technical expertise. As the bodies of dead soldiers were returned in bags to the mainland, pressure mounted to recall the living. From the summer of 1989, they began coming back, although the final pullout was not accomplished until the spring of 1990. More than 1000 Indian soldiers had died in the conflict. The decision to send in troops to Sri Lanka was consistent with India's growing perception of itself as the rightful regional hegemon in the South Asia. In demographic and economic terms, it dominated the region and it was now determined to express this dominance in terms of military preparedness as well. In January 1987, Indian infantry units mounted a large exercise on the Pakistan border, ostensibly to test new equipment, but really to display to the old enemy a newfound power. Then in March 1988, India tested its first surface-to-surface -surface missile capable of attacking targets up to a distance of 100 miles away. An year later, it successfully tested a more sophisticated device which would carry a load 10 times more powerful and reach targets 1500 miles away. Indian missile scientists had taken their country into an exclusive club whose only other members were the United States, Soviet Union, United Kingdom, France, China and Israel. These developments attracted apprehension in the smaller countries of South Asia. The blunder of sending the peace force and then recalling it was to have lasting impact which was to cost Rajiv Gandhi his life after few years. In our next video, we will discuss the final years of Rajiv Gandhi's tenure as Prime Minister. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and comment because discussion is solution. For more discussions, please subscribe our channel.